I'm Tim Knox, director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, and we're standing in the Dutch gallery, and I've got here Wim Peves, who's director general of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. We're standing in front of one of our more controversial masterpieces, the now demoted Rembrandt um, portrait of a man. Wim has more Rembrandts in his gallery than he can shake a stick at. Tell me, what do you think of the Fitzwilliam Museum? Ah, I, I thought we were talking about it. We come back on this guy later on, maybe. It's a beautiful painting, I mean, whether if it's a Rembrandt or not, first, having said that. I like the Fitzwilliam as a museum, but maybe more as a house, as a home where you feel comfortable. I mean, you see tapestry, you see furniture, you see paintings, you see beautiful works of art, and it's all, how to say, it's called the Fitzwilliam house style, if I'm right. It, it's a kind of, of very welcoming atmosphere where you see everything at a glance. You see all the pieces. That's the first impression. The second impression, you really have to, to zoom in on objects, on, on a vase or a, a chair or a painting. And I think that's the, comparing to other museums, this is everything uh, as a whole. Yes, actually, absolutely. In fact, that sort of house style was developed yeah. in the 1930s by Sidney Cockrell. And he was very inspired by Dr. von Bode in Berlin. Yeah. But also there's a great Dutch art historian called Huizinga. Schmidt Degenen. No. I think so. I mean, yeah. he's the same time. And so. he, he argued for this kind of um, synthesis of yeah. paintings and furniture of the period and yeah. carpets on the floor and yeah. flowers. I think that's, I think that's uh, Frederik Schmidt Degenen, who was a director in the Rijksmuseum for 25 years or something like that. And he, also inspired by Bode, indeed, and uh, with Cockerell you had here <coughs> at the Fitzwilliam. I mean, it was at that time fashionable to mix up everything. I mean, exactly the same that we did in the New Reichs Museum. I was going to say, again. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So mixing up uh, all the all the departments, all the objects. So furniture, weapons, uh, costume, paintings, model ships, model ships the yeah. whole thing, uh, to give you a sense of beauty, awareness of time. That's the whole. That's the whole. Uh, red line of, in, in the Rijksmuseum uh, installation nowadays. Um, and comparing to the, the, the former fashion, which was in the 50s and the 60s, to separate any th uh, all the objects, to, to have white walls, yeah. uh, everything on eye level, paintings over there. You have a gallery of glass, you have a gallery of, of armory, you have a gallery of um, decorate, decorative art. So not art, but decorative art. Yeah. So all separated. Well, now, at the early 21st century, it is, well, maybe we're back in the times of Cockerell and the times of, of Schmid Degener to, to mix up. And, uh, well, this is a very contemporary gallery now. So, observing your audiences now at the, at the Rijksmuseum, what sort of changes have you noticed um, the way that people engage with art? Um, well, we cater a mass audience. I mean, it's the National Museum, the National Museum for Art and History. Um, we have a 2.5 million audience, which is a large audience. 50% is Dutch, that means the other 50% is coming from all over the world. Uh, Chinese, uh, from Europe, uh, Americans, and they all have different expectations, a different background. They're not only professionals or experts, they're also tourists just coming for the day or just coming to see that one single painting, The Night Watch by Rembrandt. I mean, for several reasons, we have an uh, enormous variety of people. And yeah, I think that's completely new comparing to, let's say, 50 or 60 years ago, where most museums, including the Rijksmuseum, was very much more focused on one kind of visitors. Yes. The, 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 the well-educated, uh, middle or higher class uh, people who were specially coming to a museum to enjoy the arts. And now everybody's coming, not only to enjoy the arts, but also to just go to the Rijksmuseum as a tourist destination. Whether if, it, whether if it's good or not, I mean, it's, it's, it's what happened. And that's something that um, I very much noticed on my visits to the newly refurbished Rijksmuseum, yeah. is that um, there's a great deal of emphasis put on the sort of other things like the shop and the um, um, you know very nice restaurant where you have a range of them yeah. um, and uh, obviously various public programs things for people to do mm -hmm. um, the amazing displays of flowers in the hall yeah. and so on like yeah. that that's all part of that kind of trying to enrich yeah. people's lives yeah 
That's correct. I mean, what we did, the complete refurbishment in 2013, the, the grand reopening, uh, after 10 years of renovation and, and making plans, what happened in that time is that we were looking around and I was, I was uh, looking to other public buildings, not only museums, but also to, to, to other public buildings and, and looking what was going around. And, and I thought, okay, what are best examples and what's, what can a museum learn from other practices? And I, I uh, suddenly I, I came in, in Tate Modern that just reopened at that, at that time, or opened at that time, the Tate Modern, and I saw that it's not only about the galleries, of course they're the most important part of the museum still, but what Tate Modern has is, is a welcoming open hall, a big work of art, uh, restaurants, beautiful view, it, it has a big shop, it has all kinds of facilities that, that people like nowadays very much, uh, being part of a museum experience. So in the old days it is figured that people, if they go two hours to a museum, they spend really about two hours standing in front of a paintings or paintings in, in, in the galleries. Nowadays it's different. They still have an average of about two hours in the museum, though the galleries is more or less one hour and the other 60 minutes is uh, in and the shop, uh, having coffee, or just have a talk, or walk around, or, or whatever it is. So, the whole museum experience um, is completely different than in the past. And again, whether you like it or not, it's 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 common practice in the museum world. So, I think this was, in a way, some of Cockrell's ideas behind his yeah. rearrangement of the museum here, and certainly his successor, Carl Winter, mm -hmm. much later on said that what he hoped, he would create a kind of civilizing environment so yeah. that the brutish student who just rode all the time or <laughs> you know, did his maths all the time would yeah. occasionally come in here and find here with its carpets and flowers and masterpieces and yeah. stuff like that, something of a, a window into a different world and yeah. so on. And yeah. I suppose you might also argue yeah. the same you know, today in that very contemporary Reichsmuseum. Yeah. Well, I, I read about your book about the, the, the Jubilee of, of the Fitzwilliam and Cockerell, of course, is, is one of the main characters in the whole history of this, of this institution. And, and um, indeed, what he did in, in his time is still very much what we do or like to do in our times, uh, making a welcoming place and indeed giving a a window in a different world. I mean, that's well said. Uh, and to, well, he's he's talking about making a making this place a palace. Well, a palace is 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 nice. Although, to me, a palace is more elite. I would I would rather say it's it's it, you might regard it as a palace, but uh, but everybody's palace. Does like he, he, like Neil McGregor said, it's it's everybody's private collection in a way. Yes. So yes. That, that's in in that in that sense. Now. Cockrell's great um, distinguishing feature was his love of acquisitions. Yeah. And he even had special labels printed for the Fitzwilliam, which he used to put on things when he visited people's houses, yeah. usually when they were dying. Yeah. What about your own track record with acquisitions for the Reichsmuseum? Ooh, um, I mean, we have many, many departments, like, like the Fitzwilliam, but even more. Um, so we have specialists in every field, decorative arts, 20th century Dutch arts, uh, of old masters, Chinese, Indian, um, well, all kinds of, 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 of fields where we collect and we're active. So, and we have an a collection of about a million objects, which is a lot. Um, after having been director now for eight years, uh, I don't even know how many acquisitions we did. Uh, I mean, gifts, donations, uh, but also acquisitions that we bought on the market, on auction or uh, at fairs or whatever. Um, yes, it's, it's, I think, one of the things and the nice things of being a museum director that you have the possibility to enrich and to let the collection grow. Well, growth as such is not so important, but to enrich the collection with, well, maybe missing links or, or uh, very strong wishes from uh, from century. One in, one example is, for instance, in our case, an Adrian de Vries, which is yeah. a, a Dutch sculptor. Well, he was born in Holland, though most of his career was was all over Europe. And strange enough, no single museum in Holland had an Adrian de Vries. Yeah, we had a very small silver plaquette, beautiful, but not a freestanding, big, yeah. large sculpture. 
I mean, to see that you have to go to Prague or to Sweden or to Italy or to the Getty or yeah. whatever. So um, Adrian de Vries was really, I think, number one on our wish list. And I was very happy to have the opportunity to, to buy one. I mean, not, not because they're on the market every year. No, they're not. Yeah. But in my tenure, in, in my time, being a director, of, well, in this period of, of where we live in, yes, there was an Adrian de Vries, and yes, we were uh, happy and, and had the funds, 28 million euros, to buy it. Go. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it, it should come on the market. Yeah. It should be on your wish list. And then it's the, it's the hard true. part, a dream come yeah. true, but you need to get the money. Yeah. And, and all these three were yes at a certain moment. So I'm, I, I, I'm looking back on, on a very fruitful period of having, having done some, some great acquisitions, including two Rembrandts together with the Louvre. And that was a, that was a sort of new departure really, buying yeah. in concert, you know, in partnership yeah. with a, yeah. a major museum in another country. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're known for doing things out of the box. Yeah. Do you wake up every morning and think of, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something different this time? Or, or what, um, how do these sort of um, well, uh, bright well, ideas What I try about? to do is to make it happen. And, and the two Rembrandts that we bought from the Rothschild is, um, 160 million euros. It's it's it's. I mean, it, it's the, the the highest price ever paid by a museum. Uh, in this case, for two paintings, two full Rembrandt lengths. paintings by so, Rembrandt. Full yeah. length. Full length. Rembrandt. Special. So smart. Yeah. It's 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 art and history, and yeah. they they are. I think the last five Rembrandts that are really really very very special to be on the market at all, um, and these to came on the market. And I always said that if Rembrandts in this category come on the market, you are obliged as the museum director of the Rijksmuseum to move. Uh, and of course, I do not have 160 million. So I went to Paris, spoke to uh, Jean-Luc Martinez the other day, and I said, OK, what's, what are the possibilities? You, you buy them? No, he said, no, I don't have the money. I can't buy them. We don't have the money, so let's, let's give it a try. And, and one of the alternative models was that we share the acquisition, France would do 80 million and we did 80 million and we is the Dutch state as the French state at the end did. So what's the deal? Do you get the man, should they get the girl? Yeah, officially we have the man and they have the lady. Um, <laughs> oh really? So that's yeah, yeah, how it yeah, works? Yeah, 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 right. Exactly, yeah. that's, that's yeah. how it happened. But what is more important is that we were both convinced that these, it's a married couple, so they should stay together yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, unless there will be a war between France and Holland, which nobody knows, but uh, I'm not uh, counting on that. But anyway, these two belong together. Yeah. And, and uh, so we had to make some legal uh, contracts, etc., uh, where it said, okay, you have the lady, we have the man, but they should always be exhibited together. So they are now in the Louvre, and this summer they will come to Amsterdam. And how often will the visiting rights yeah, change over? Yeah, first we do it. It's, it's like the National Gallery. Yeah, and Dublin. A, and yeah. Uh, no, the, yeah, Dublin, they also have a yeah. share. But in, in England, there was a model, and we also looked at that contract. We used even that contract as a blueprint. Uh, the London National Gallery and, and Edinburgh. Oh, right, now yes, the, of course. The, yeah, the, Edinburgh, the Titian. The Titians, yeah. The Titians. So, um, it's a kind of shared ownership, and Scotland is still part of the, of the yeah. UK, so it's, it's one country. Yeah. In our case, it's France and the Netherlands, two different countries. Anyway, it's, it's a shared ownership. Um, we have it now three months in the Louvre, then three months in Amsterdam. After that, one month in the Louvre, uh, sorry, one year in the Louvre, one year in Amsterdam, three years there, three years here, and at the end, it will alternate every eight years. Yeah. So I think that's okay. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. Now, finally, just to sort of wrap yeah. up, um, what sort of advice would you have for a museum like the Fitzwilliam Museum, which um, you know is um, 200 years old yeah. this year? Yeah. Um, we haven't had a major kind of refurbishment for what a decade or so, uh -huh. um, but obviously we've got lots of plans in the pipeline. Um, any particular advice for a medium-sized museum with half the number of objects you have, not quite the same responsibilities, certainly not the same number of Rembrandt? Yeah, but it's not the n the number of objects you have. I, I think. The strength of the Fitzwilliam is, is that it's a house. It's, it's, it has a kind of coziness. So I would embrace that. That's one thing. Another thing is maybe that's, but I'm, I'm only uh, visiting, visiting director for a moment, but 
But I would think of, uh, because you also have this 20th century contemporary yeah. department, which is a bit, in my opinion, too much isolated from the rest. So I would think of incorporating a kind of contemporary feel in these galleries. And you can do that uh, in the way you do, you program the galleries now. I mean, tapestries, why having these old tapestries? You can do Grayson Perry ceramics or, 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 um, or, or contemporary tapestries or contemporary furniture. And then something happens. I mean, we in the Gallery of Honor, we invited um, uh, Anish Kapoor to, yeah. res to respond on Rembrandt. And some people find it ugly, some people like it. Uh, nevertheless, it, it works, it, give a it gives a confrontation and, and that's one thing. But what I think is more important, because it's different, people start looking better. They start looking better at Kapoor. And at the same time, they start looking better at the old masters already there as being part of the, of the gallery of honor. So a kind of interventions within the beautiful galleries, because they are beautiful, uh, of the Fritz William. There are, there are, I, would, I would look in that direction. Well, thank you very much. We've, we're really enjoying having you this long weekend. Um, and thank you very much for your thoughts. Okay. Really nice. It's a pleasure. Thank you.